and starting at verse 16. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Skip with me down to the beginning of chapter 3. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? And the, woman, uh, the man said, The woman whom you gave me to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you've done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And I want to share with you this morning about the original lie. The original lie. Let's pray together as we look into the Lord's word today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us your wonderful word. It is a lamp for our feet and a light for our path. Jesus said that the word of God is like seed. So God, we ask that you'd let our hearts be good soil to receive and retain everything you have for us today. Jesus said that his words were spirit and life. So Father, I pray that you'd send the Holy Spirit to minister that life of Jesus to us now. We pray in his name. Amen and amen. Well, last week we began a new series of sermons which we're calling Clean. And over the next few weeks, we're going to be taking a journey together talking about how to live clean. Last week, Pastor Glenn shared with us how that we live in a dirty world. And I still haven't recovered from that <laughs> recitation of microbes, Pastor. But thank God, we also heard that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Last week, Pastor spelled out for us very powerfully what took place when Adam and Eve disobeyed God. That event, which we call the fall of man, introduced sin and death into our world, and this has warped all of creation. It has subjected the creation to weakness and to death. Sin cost man his relationship with God, and ultimately it would cost God the death of his precious son to bring us back to him. This week we're going to look into that well-known passage of scripture, both Christians and non-Christians alike have heard the story of the temptation in the garden. But how did Adam and Eve come to fall in the first place? What was the key that unlocked the door of sin there in the Garden of Eden? As we heard last week, we all have also committed sin just as they did. What is this deadly key that causes us to unlock the door of sin in our lives as well? I want to submit to you that this master key of trouble for the human race is this. It is believing the lies of the devil instead of trusting in God and believing his truth. We release trouble into our lives by welcoming and sheltering and feeding the lies of the enemy of our souls as well as the lies of human beings who also can tempt us to do wrong. When we nourish the devil's destructive words within our hearts, 
we are cooperating with him as he seeks to bring us down into deeper levels of deception. It seems to be human nature, doesn't it, that once our hearts are deceived, we start to actually fight for the lies that we've been nurturing. In fact, we can come to defend them as if they were our own children, accepting, practicing, and cherishing the lies of the enemy is a Pandora's box that releases misery into our lives. You know, church, in order to become spiritually mature, at some point we will have to recognize that not everyone has your best interest at heart. Jesus said the devil is a liar, and he's been a liar since the beginning. When he speaks a lie, Jesus said he's just speaking it out of his own nature. He is merely doing what comes naturally to him. He is the father of lies. And so I want to suggest to you today, if you're worried about your life, that the power that is holding you trapped, it may not be anything as dramatic as demons. It may not be the devil's ability to do false miracles or spread false doctrines among Christians. No, it's very likely that the thing which keeps us mired in sin or just keeps us stuck in life is our willingness to entertain lies. Lies about God. Lies about yourself. Lies about what sin will do to us. This is the real battle in your life. Recognizing lies, choosing not to follow lies, and then having the power to walk in the truth instead. That is the battlefield where Satan will oppose you. You'll know, many of you, of course, that as Christians, we are commanded to wear what the Bible calls the armor of God. And if you don't know what that is, you can read about it later in the book of Ephesians chapter 6. But once you've put on the armor of God and you're dressed for spiritual combat, what does our battle actually look like? Many people today think that spiritual warfare means having a duel with demons or fighting the dark powers in the heavenly places. And I would never deny that there are times that God might lead us into encounters of that type. But the New Testament spotlights for us a very different concern. When speaking about this armor of God, Paul says in Ephesians 6, he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Everybody say wiles. Notice he did not say stand against demons or come against the strongholds of the enemy. And you may conceivably be called to do that in your life or ministry. But it seems that the armor is first given to us so that we can stand against the devil's wiles, his deceptions. The word wiles here is the Greek word methodeia. And just as it appears, this is the place from which we get our English word method. Methodeia means a well-planned scheme or a strategy which is designed to trap you. So here in Ephesians, it means that the devil has formulated a plan to catch you and is lying in wait for you. He has that little box with the carrot inside and the stick and you the rabbit that is a methodeia and as we continue to learn how the lord makes us clean and keeps us clean we need to devote a little time to learning how to spot and avoid the traps of the enemy some people don't like to talk about this subject matter at all but the apostle paul said it's a good thing to be able to recognize the devil's strategies Paul said in 2 Corinthians 2.11, he said, we are not ignorant of Satan's devices. And we shouldn't be ignorant of them either. So let's take time today to learn how to spot some of his traps. We want to discover an antidote, if we can, for the poison of the serpent's lies and discover how to get out of the prison where sin has placed us. Let's look together at this story of the temptation and get some wisdom that will enable us to crush the lies that may be crippling us today. There are three keys that we see here in Genesis 3. And the first one is this, understanding how the devil's lies will come. Understanding how the devil's lies will come. You know, the devil doesn't change his game plan. He doesn't have to change his playbook very much. And there's a good reason for that. He doesn't have to. 
He doesn't need to be very creative in order to fool the likes of you and me. The Bible says that we are like sheep. And can I tell you that sheep are not known for being the intellectual heavyweights of the animal kingdom. <laughs> the enemy has the benefit of experience and he has the benefit of battle-tested tactics. I'm sorry to tell you that the devil is very good at what he does. But understanding how these lies come, learning how a lie is packaged to you can help us when we're tempted. First, lies will come through a smooth-talking salesman. Through a smooth-talking salesman. You know, the devil always puts his best face on. Satan was the original false advertiser. And we read in verse 1 of Genesis 3 that the serpent was crafty. I want you to notice with me that Eve is not having a conversation here with a cobra or a copperhead. This is no ordinary snake. The Hebrew word that is translated in our English Bibles as serpent is really a word that means a shining one. Someone who has the appearance of shining, polished brass. His appearance was striking. His appearance was designed to dazzle you. And he had great intelligence, charisma, and cleverness. This is the original smooth-talking devil. Where do you think that expression came from anyway? He uses sympathetic words and a soothing voice. He's on her side. God is unfair. God is holding you back. See, what you need is this. This is going to put you over. This is going to take you to where you really deserve to be in life. Pastor Glenn, I'm scaring myself. I'm too good at that. <laughs> if Genesis 3 was a movie, you know, everybody would be yelling at the screen, girlfriend, he's playing you. He's playing you. Don't go in there, you know. <laughs> now you know I'm right. Isn't this how temptation worms its way into our minds, though? And human tempters, they work the same way as the devil does. They dangle in front of you a sparkling future. It's free of all the restrictions that all the mean people want to put on you. They want somehow, somehow tempters want better for you than those who know you and love you the most. How does that work? But Satan's advertising never reveals the final destination of the road that looks so promising at the outset. His ad campaign has no purses, uh, no addicts who snatch purses because they need a fix. He never shows you STDs. He never shows you the ravages of alcohol or broken families. The devil never tells you just how unmarketable your resume can become after a few little scrapes with the law. Everything in the devil's brochure is clean and fresh. Everybody in the devil's infomercial is good-looking and has great teeth. <laughs> He's a smooth salesman, and he offers you fun that will never go sour, or so he says. Christians realize this. Lies come to you with smooth talk that is too good to be true. And second, lies will come when Satan sees that you're not on guard. Lies will come at you. Temptation comes at you when you're not on guard. In my opinion, Eve was not on her guard that day. She was not ready for a spiritual conversation at that moment. Have you ever had that experience? Somebody zings you and you're not ready for that kind of conversation. Eve's antennae were not up. He came at her. He kicked off a conversation very bluntly and in a manner that was meant to rattle you. Hey, did God really say that? She got zapped by a question out of the blue, caught off guard by temptation. It will hit you when you're not ready. It also appears that Eve was isolated that day. Temptation will often come at you when you are alone, when you are away from the input of friends and spouses. Guys, we know that Adam often gets blamed here. Where was he? Why didn't he defend his wife? He probably should have, but it does seem to me from the story that Eve had her own set of car keys. <laughs> she could have left at any time, but the Bible says she took 
the fruit from the tree. And that's important. The devil did not deliver the fruit to her. She either walked over to the tree herself or else she was already there. Isolation and temptation are a dangerous mixture. As a Christian, listen, as a Christian, listen to me, you need fellowship. And you need accountability in your life. It's a good exercise to do. Check your life. Think about what the course of your week always looks like and see if you have too much alone time. How do lies come? Lies will also come to people who are not willing to welcome the word. Not willing to welcome the word. Satan will hit you at any point and he'll hit you on any topic where he sees that you are just a little bit fuzzy about what the word of God says. I better say that again. Satan will hit you at any point in any topic where he can see that you're a little bit fuzzy about what God has said. It doesn't seem from this story in the scripture that Eve was very devoted to learning the word of God, even though her Bible only had two chapters. <laughs> Genesis 1 and 2, that's it. And even though her Bible only had two chapters, when Satan challenged her on what God had said, she mangled it. See, first she added to the word. She said God had forbidden them to eat the fruit or even to touch it. God never said that. Second, Eve changed the word and she undercut God's command. She said we can't eat it lest we die. Now, if your old-fashioned English isn't, isn't too good this morning, let me help you. That word, lest, Eve was saying, in other words, we can't eat it because if we do, something bad might happen to us. We might die if we eat it. That wasn't what God said. God said, you will surely die. And third, Eve subtracted from the word of God. See, God had said, in the very same day that you eat of it. But Eve left that part out, see? And by doing that, she lost the sense of urgency in God's command and warning. Church, let's learn from Eve's example this morning. It's so important that we learn the word of God as best we can. You may not be called to become a pastor, become a Bible scholar, go to Bible school, but we need to either know what God says or know how to find out. That's our first wisdom key, understanding how the devil's lies will come to you, what the package of sin looks like, and when it might arrive on your doorstep. Christians, new and old, we need to be alert for the smooth and slick packaging of sin in our generation. Be on guard and do not isolate yourself. And be sure to welcome the word of God into your life. The second wisdom key here is this, understanding what the devil's lies contain. We need to understand what the devil's lies contain. We just looked at the shiny packaging of the lie, but that packaging is just designed to get you to lower your defenses, to be dazzled. But how does he get us to actually open the box? What is the dangerous makeup of those lies? How does the devil or a human tempter seal the deal and ultimately get you to leave the good pathway of the Lord. Well, the first thing that a person who is tempting you will do is this. He tells you there won't be any consequences. The devil comes bearing deadly fruit to you, but he knows that before you will take a bite, he first has to convince you of the original lie found in verse 4 that says, you shall not surely die. This was the first lie ever told to a human being, the first lie in the Bible. And our first parents believed it, and that makes it the most catastrophic lie of all time. You will not surely die. And when we decide to give in to temptation, isn't that what we're telling ourselves? Aren't we echoing the original lie? We do a good job of telling ourselves, well, others may be tricked, Others may suffer because of their choices, but not me. I am immune, even though everybody else may get stung. We hear that expressed a hundred different ways. People say things to us, well, it's okay. You've got plenty of time. 
You got plenty of time when you're old for God. No need to rush into it. Or how about, well, it's okay. A little bit won't hurt you. Or how about the ones that we do to ourselves? It's okay. I can handle my liquor. I don't have far to drive. Or, well, I'm not really gambling a lot if you compare it to my whole paycheck. <laughs> well, you never heard anybody say anything like that? Or, I'm using protection. Nothing's going to happen. Or, nobody will notice if a few pieces go missing. Who's going to miss it? Sign here. Who's going to know? It's okay. Everybody does it. What are you, chicken? Consequences can be deadly. Maybe you know that old saying that says, sow a thought and you reap a deed. You sow a deed and you reap a habit. You sow a habit and you reap a character. And you sow a character and you reap a destiny. When I was in high school, I had a friend named Debbie. And in the small town where I grew up in upstate Connecticut, we, we had a lot of hills. We had a lot, a lot of winding roads. And uh, one day, Debbie was in the car with her boyfriend as he decided to race another boy up a narrow street. One car was in the right lane, but the other car with Debbie in it deliberately drove up the street in the wrong lane. And of course, that was the lane for the oncoming traffic. And the two drivers took the foolish chance that no car would be coming from the opposite direction. Against all the warnings of the law, everything that had been drummed into you and driver's ed and parental advice and common sense, the boys figured that there wouldn't be any consequences. But they were wrong because a car came down that hill, came into their spur-of-the-moment drag race in the other lane, and Debbie was tragically killed at the age of only 15. And sin is like that. Eve wasn't completely convinced, not really, that anything bad would happen when she disobeyed the word of the Lord. But she was wrong about that, just as surely as Debbie's boyfriend was wrong. And you and I have been just as wrong whenever we've listened to the lie the lie that sin has no consequences. The Bible is not harsh, but loving when it says, be not deceived. God is not mocked because whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. Adam and Eve's sin was a sin that seemed so tiny, so free of risk, but it was really a snowball that kept rolling downhill until it became an avalanche and we've all been buried under it. What's your Sin of choice today, liquor, pot, coke, illicit sex, something else, it will not leave you the same person. It will deal you out some frightful consequences. If not today, then certainly someday. Thank God he can and will forgive us and cleanse us and set us free, but how much better never to have to go down that road and see the consequences of the original lie. A second powerful lie is this. The tempter tells you, you can construct a life without the Lord. You can build a life without the Lord. In verse 6, it tells us, Eve also saw that the fruit was good for food. She thought it was something that could nourish her life. She rejected the good banquet that the Lord had provided, and she substituted, listen, she substituted a source of life that was of inferior quality. And that represents to us in this story the deadly lie that we can build a life without God. Just like we do, Eve said to herself, well, I know this isn't what God would want me to eat, but I don't need God to tell me how to live. I don't need him to tell me how to feed myself. I want to tell you, church, the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And if you're not feeding and building your life on what he gives you, your life is going to be hollow. It will never satisfy. And in our generation, we need to recapture the truth about these things. Do not believe the lie that says that you can build your life on what God forbids. The one who made you knows what's best for us. And he knows what the consequence will be of going the opposite way. The third lie in the devil's story uh, is this. 
He says, you are wiser than God. You are wiser than God. Satan promised Eve that if she ate the fruit, their eyes would be opened and they would be like God's. The devil always claims to people that he will give them enlightenment and spiritual truth. But these are empty promises. Don't believe the lie that somehow you can tap into some hidden secrets of the new age that are going to catapult you to some new level of wisdom. The devil doesn't even have any wisdom to give you. All he has is the same old lies that left Adam and Eve naked and ashamed, and his lies will leave you in the same condition. Yes, we need to pursue wisdom, but the first step on the path of real wisdom is to fear the Lord. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That means that we need to honor him and revere him above all. Study God's word. Learn to know what pleases and displeases the Lord. See, the Bible says wisdom is the main thing. It's the principal thing. But you'll never get wisdom from sitting cross-legged on the floor and emptying out your mind. You'll only find wisdom and spiritual contentment by sitting at the feet of Jesus. So may God give us understanding first to know how lies come. And second, we need help from God to discern and identify the lies of men and the devil, the lies that are pulling us away from obedience. And the final wisdom key that we need is this. It's understanding how the devil's lies are crushed. How the devil's lies are crushed. How can we break the power of those lies in our lives? How can we stop the cycles of sin that are keeping us bound? You know, it was the sin of Adam that made me a captive of the devil's kingdom. But it was my own sin and my own willingness to listen to lies that chained me up to the wall of his palace. And it's the lies that we're acting upon that are keeping us bound. How can we break out? Well, first thing we've got to do is drop the blame game. End the blame game. Everybody in this story had somebody to blame. Eve blamed the tempter. Maybe some of us take that route also. But the devil made me do it has never been a good excuse. If it didn't work there, not going to work for you. James 1.14 says, Every man is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires, by his own lusts, and enticed. Adam blamed his wife. This was dodging the blame, and it was also peer pressure, if you like. And that wasn't an excuse either. Keep reading further down in Genesis 3, and you'll see that one of the things that God rebuked Adam for is because God said, you listen to her voice. Now, men and women, you know, we, we laugh about some of the elements in this story and so forth. But listen, there's something serious and important there. Do not let the influence of other people, the voice of other people, trump the word of God in your life. And then in what is probably one of the dumbest moves ever, I see that Adam blamed God. Talk about chutzpah, right? Adam says to God, God, um, the woman that you gave me. Remember that nap last Thursday? The woman that you gave me to be with me, she gave me to eat, and so, well, you know, I ate. Wow. Young people, I do not recommend this tactic. Especially if, like Adam, you have just ruined the universe. I hope the teenagers are taking notes, you know. They come out with things like this sometimes. Well, Dad, you were the one that let me drive the car. <laughs> so don't go there, all right? But I see people in this story blaming God, blaming the devil, blaming each other, but I don't see anybody taking the blame. I don't see anybody saying, you know, my bad, you know, NBA. I don't see anybody doing that. And in our passing the buck and blame shifting, we all resemble our father, Adam. Do you want to break the devil's yoke off your life? If you do, then we can start by going to God and saying, God, this mess is mine. I made it. Now, listen, I know there's always two sides to every story. 
I know that there's other people that had a part to play, but listen, if we're going to be honest with ourselves and grow up spiritually, we ought to take responsibility for who we are today. Another thing we need to do is this. Listen to the Creator's voice once again. Listen to God's voice once again as He calls us to regulate our lives by His words. This is a serious question we need to ask ourselves. What is the rule? What is the philosophy that governs my life? What are the truths that I base my decision-making upon? Is it my own ideas? Is it somebody else's opinions? It, is it a personal philosophy? You know, uh, if it feels good, do it. Looking out for number one. You remember that one? If we truly want to live clean and free, we need to make a serious commitment to allow God's word to govern our lives, our actions and behavior. Don't fall into the trap that Eve fell into here. Eve had the word of God, but she allowed Satan to whisper into her ear. She allowed the devil to put suspicions about God's motivations into her heart. And that is a common trap, especially for young people. Uh, young people often feel that God and other authority figures in their lives are holding them back from experiencing life and enjoying life. Somebody needs to hear this today. There are not any perfect parents in the world. And when you're a parent, you won't be perfect either. And if we fail to honor our parents, we will always be emotional and spiritual adolescents. I want you to know that people who cannot relate to authority who can't submit to authority, whether it's at work, home, government, school, church, wherever, people who cannot submit to authority are always miserable. In our course that we teach here, sometimes called Cleansing Stream, we talk about how people resent it when God uh, in the Bible tells us not to engage in certain behaviors. Is God a buzzkill? Is God a spoil sport? No, the reason God commands us not to do certain things is because he is jealous over you. We sing a song that starts that way around here. It says, he is jealous for me. Have you thought about what that means? Human jealousy is ugly, but the jealousy of God is holy. It's an important aspect of his love. God's jealousy means that he doesn't want you to get away from him. He wants the very best for you. His jealousy is the passion that he has for you to belong to him. See, God knows that in the Bible, some of the things he forbids are destructive to individuals and to families. They wreck families and they wreck communities. God knows that some of the things that he forbids us to do will actually open us up, will actually expose us to the risk of demonic inroads in our lives. God has bought us at such a high price, the blood of his son. And he wants us to experience the good future that he has in his mind for you and me. In Proverbs chapter 4, God says these beautiful words, My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. Those are not the words of a dictator. That is a plea from a loving father who wants the best for us. Let's treasure his words once again and learn them and live by them. Living life under the rules that we've made for ourselves isn't doing some of us a whole lot of good. So whether we're 16 or 106, listening to his voice will give us life and peace. One more thing that we need to do if we're going to break out of the devil's prison camp and live clean and free, and it's this. Call upon the serpent crusher. Call upon the serpent crusher. Pastor Jason, team, you can come back if you would. Genesis 3, 15 is sometimes called the first gospel because that is the place in the scriptures where God first makes to us the promise of a redeemer. The Lord said, I will put enmity, that means a state of war, between you, the serpent, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. You know, God is so very kind. On that very darkest of days, the day that we got expelled from paradise, he was giving us hope. He was promising us that someday someone was going to come along who would crush the head of the enemy. It would be the seed of the woman. I mean, if you know, woman does not have a seed. It would be the seed of a woman. It would be the virgin born Jesus who would defeat 
the serpent. Our Redeemer would be bruised to give us that victory. He would suffer and die to bring us life. And because of his death and resurrection, everyone who feels trapped and defeated can have hope today. I want you to know that sin is a supernatural problem and it requires a supernatural solution. Sin can't be broken by New Year's resolutions. It can't be defeated in your life by the power of positive thinking. It requires a change of heart, a new birth that only the Spirit of God can provide for you. In just the same way, the devil is a supernatural foe. Human weapons and strategies can't bring him down, but the power of the living Christ can. Jesus has all authority, and he said, I'm going to give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Because of Jesus, today you can be freed from the guilt of sin and its power. You can break the cycles in your life that are condemning you to become just like the people who hurt you. You can break out of prison today and come out from the dominion of darkness. Jesus wants to give somebody hope here today that change is possible. He said, the thief only comes to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. What's the antidote for the devil's poison? It's simply this, calling on the name of Jesus, the serpent crusher, and inviting him to take control of your life. It's not by human cleverness or ability, but it's by his cross that he defeated sin and death and the devil. Paul tells us in Colossians 2, And you he's made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers. That's the devil and his his uh, cohorts. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. See, the cross of Jesus Christ releases grace to you. It gives you power against what's plaguing you internally and against what's coming at you externally. Church, in order to get victory, in order to live clean, we're going to have to drop that blame game. We need to return to the word of God and allow God's word to regulate our living. And then we need to call upon the supernatural delivering power of Jesus who crushed the serpent's head. Jesus has power to break every chain in your life today. May God give us grace to turn from the original lie and every lie and live clean through his power. Come on, let's stand together and praise him today. Come on, give Jesus a great hand of praise. Thank Jesus. Thank Jesus that he crushed the serpent's head. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, you reign. Jesus, you're the victor, Lord. Jesus, you're the conqueror. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Come on, I want you to lift a hand, and we're going to sing a song. And I want to ask you to just, if you would, use this song as a vehicle to render your heart to the Lord. Come on, let's sing, Lord, I give you my heart today, Jesus. Lord, I give you my heart. Give you my soul. I'll live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. Lord, have our hands and our face to heaven just give Jesus thanks today oh come Holy Spirit blow your breath over our hearts today thank you Jesus for your delivering power maybe you're here today and you made a mess of your life or maybe people would look at you and look at what you are outwardly and say there goes a very respectable and moral person 
doesn't really matter because everyone needs the forgiveness, the grace of Jesus Christ. The Bible says all of us, all of us like sheep have gone astray. We have each turned to his own way. But the Lord God has laid upon him, upon Jesus, the iniquity of us all. What a beautiful exchange. Punished in my place. And because of that, if you're trapped in a cycle of sin today, Jesus wants to set you free. If the guilt of sin is filling your heart and you can't sleep at night because of what you've done, Jesus offers you forgiveness and peace. If you feel dirty today because of what you've done, Jesus wants to make you clean. Maybe you've heard what I had to share today and you say, I am one of those prisoners of the devil because of what I've done and what I'm doing. Jesus can unlock your chains. Jesus said, I am the one who was dead and I am alive and I have the keys of hell and of death. Let's bow our hearts and our heads all over this room. And quickly, I just want to give people an opportunity to pray, to invite Jesus to come and be their Lord and be the serpent crusher in their lives today. Would you raise a hand? Maybe you've never invited Jesus to be your Lord, but if you'd like to know God through Jesus Christ and experience his transformation, I want to invite you to raise a hand this morning. By raising your hand, you're just saying, I need Jesus. Jesus, I need you, and I need you to transform my life today. I see a hand there. Who else? Who else wants a life-transforming touch from Jesus? There's another hand. Jesus, we need you. We need you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else, you need a life-transforming touch from Jesus today that will get you off the merry-go-round of sin. Let's pray together, and as I pray, let's all pray together. Help some people find their way home to the Lord today. Say, Dear Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I'm sorry for my sins. I need forgiveness. I need your abundant life. Lord Jesus, I confess you as Lord today. I believe you died for me. I believe in my heart that God raised you from the dead. And I turn from my own ways now. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Be my Lord and Savior. Fill me with your spirit. Give me the fresh start that I need. Give me the breakthroughs that I need. Break every chain in my life. Help me to walk in your ways every day. Amen and amen. Come on, give him a hand of praise. Just thank him. Thank him for what he's doing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you prayed a prayer like that this morning for the first time, then right after we conclude our service in prayer in just a few moments, I want to invite you to come to the front. There'll be some friends here who want to give you some materials that will help you get started in a new life with Jesus. And then make sure you're here on Wednesday as we take a fresh look on Wednesday evenings on the, into the Word of God together. People will be here to pray with you, talk to you about this step that you've taken, and pray with you for needs that you have in your life. Let's just take a moment and let's just pray for all of us, that the Lord will help us along these lines we've been sharing on today. Heavenly Father, send your Holy Spirit to us, Lord. Make us aware. Help us. Give us the grace to spot the inroads of the enemy, Lord. Father, make us wise to reject the shiny packaging of the devil's temptation. Make us alert, Lord, and on guard for those smooth-talking devils that come our way. Father, today we choose, each one of us here, we choose to build our lives on your word again. And we call upon the name of Jesus. Jesus, would you come? Would you crush the working of the enemy in our lives? Wash us, Lord. Lord, if we've fallen, we come back to you in faith. We don't hide from you as Adam because we know that if we confess our sins, you're faithful and you're just to forgive us and cleanse us through the blood of Jesus. Come on, sing it again. Lord, I give you my heart. Lord, I give you my heart.